So, if being is omnipresent, meaning existing everywhere, then the center is everywhere. Where else can the center be? <clears throat> although it could also be said, although it also could be said that as a wheel turns on an axle, so the center is the axle upon which the wheel rotates. So in the external field of life, or the relative field of life, we normally observe the periphery or the rim of the wheel. And as you know, the wheel would have so many spokes that radiates from the center hmm, to the periphery. And yet all the motion in the universe that we find is in the rim, hmm? supported by that which we know as the center, the axle. Hmm? But that center, when it comes to spiritual qualities, that center is everywhere. Hmm? For example, if you would say, where does my soul reside? Do you think you need this a bit louder? I'm not getting the feel of it. Hmm? Um, perhaps further up. Yeah, but in the spiritual aspect of life, the center is everywhere. If you should ask a person, where is your soul? Is there a place in your body where the soul exists? No, you are the soul. You are the spirit and you are the mind. And when I say you, I mean the body, the mind, and the spirit. It is just but a oneness. People, the biggest mistake they have made is to separate the three aspects of that oneness. The body, mind, and spirit. Now, what does this bring about? By the separation or concept of separation, it brings about fragmentation and not integration. And a fragmented person cannot act in daily living holistically. Hmm? One thought pulls this way and the other that way and the body reacts in a different manner. Hmm? Although the body is supported by the mind, in all its action. Now, as I said before, it is a concept hmm, that these three things are apart. Hmm? Where does the concept come from? The concept comes from the mind. What is the reality of the mind? Hmm? How real is the mind? Hmm? For anything which is real, is never changing, while the mind is forever changing. Hmm? And because it ever changes, it goes through all the various turbulences of life. Hmm? But if one could find the foundation, the basis, which is never changing, hmm? then the ever changing a relative existence of daily life hmm, would not be as harmful, hurtful, or suffering. There would be no misery. And yet if there is, because we are placed in certain circumstances, hmm, if there is misery inflicted upon us, we could uh, be strong enough to face it, because we are functioning holistically. Mind, body and spirit functions in oneness. And this functioning in oneness is called integration. So, 
man through spiritual practices and meditations is led from fragmentation to integration. Now that is the sole purpose of life. For each and every one is seeking but one thing, is seeking for happiness. But his search has become so external that he suffers the illusions of happiness and also the illusions of misery while his real nature is pure joy. For everyone is divine, just veiled over by the various concepts of the mind which, if looked at from a different angle, would seem just a superimposition upon one's real self. So here, unreality is superimposed upon reality. But because we do not recognize that reality, because we do not realize and recognize the reality, people go through sufferings and misery. And yet the desire is so strong within them, I want to be happy, I want to be happy, I want to be happy. And happiness eludes them. And the reason why it eludes them is because they do nothing at all in finding integration. Hmm? And the best way to find that integration is to do spiritual practices where you are led beyond the workings of the mind, the turbulence of the mind, and when you are led in a very scientific manner to that area beyond the mind, then you can look at the mind objectively. You are so involved in the mind, totally involved in the mind, that all sight of that deeper self, the kingdom of heaven within, is lost. Hmm? And when that is lost and not conceived or find no recognition at all, hmm? not an intellectual recognition, but a realization. It is a condition which is experiential and you bubble over with joy, joy and joy. And yet you would go through life hmm, with all its ups and downs. You are having been embodied. Hmm? You will have these things Contractions and expansions will always be there. That's the law of nature. Hmm? And you cannot deny the law of nature, for without the the contractions and expansions, this universe will not exist. Hmm? And if relativity, the universe is relativity, then relativity, if relativity disappears, the absoluteness would also disappear. If you are non-existent, then God would become non-existent. If God is non-existent, then you are non-existent. So you start from the standpoint of duality. I and thou. As Jesus would have said, worship thy Father in heaven, pray to thy Father in heaven. That is dualism. He said that to the masses uh, who could not, the peasants, who could not understand the deeper truths of unity consciousness. But to the close ones that understood him, he would say, I and my father are one. Hmm? So where is the separation? So all separations are but misconceptions manufactured by the mind. Now, 
Why does the mind manufacture these misconceptions? It has a lot to do with one's culture, background, upbringing, and might even extend to lives lived before this life, if you believe in that. And all these various experiences have left impressions upon your mind. In Sanskrit they call it sanskaras. And it is the working of these sanskaras that filter through from the subconscious level of the mind, which is the repository of these impressions, and they filter through the conscious level of the mind and make you act the way you act or think the way you think. Now, the conscious level of the mind is very, very small in comparison to the vastness of the mind. For there is only one mind. The first manifestation from the manifesta was that universal mind. But we would say, oh, my mind. Hmm? There is no truth in saying my mind. Hmm? It is like bubbles on a pond. And when we look at the bubbles, we say, oh, this bubble is a big one and that bubble is a small one. And this bubble is that or that. But after all, it is all but water of the pond. Hmm? And because of the various elements and the currents in the water, these bubbles come into being by themselves. Hmm? So it is not a creation of bubbles. So in other words, that which we call divinity has not created this universe. Hmm? But this universe is a manifestation. Fire does not create heat. It is the nature of fire to give off heat. The flower does not create fragrance. It is the nature of the flower to give off fragrance. In that way, this universe came into existence. Hmm? So the center is everywhere. Hmm? Existence does not require a pivotal point for that divine force or divine grace, or that energy, hmm? is existent in every atom, in every bit of subatomic matter. So, existence is everywhere. Hmm? So when you experience this divine joy within yourself, through realization, through the unification, with you and that which you call your father, you find that I am none separate from him. What separates me from him is my conceptions, and my conceptions guide my perceptions of life as it is lived by us in happiness or in misery. That's it. So, these conceptions being creations of the individual mind could be termed an illusion. That is the greatest illusion man has to overcome. And once through spiritual practices that illusion is overcome and you feel that omnipresence within yourself, you could embrace the entire universe in your arms, for you are not apart from the universe. You are at one with the universe. Now, these are realizations and not a rationalization. Now, through meditational and spiritual practices, you combine the left hemisphere of the brain with the right hemisphere 
where there would be a greater synaptic flow, a greater harmony. Because the left hemisphere of the brain is, does rather, thinking, rationalizing, verbalizing, symbolizing, while the right hemisphere of the brain is the one that is more connected to the intuitive level of oneself. So, through spiritual practices, when there's a greater coordination between the left and the right hemispheres of the brain, then all your actions become right actions and spontaneously. You do not force yourself to perform certain action. For forcing your mind to perform certain actions, what you are doing is just shifting around energies. You cure a headache and find yourself getting a toic. So, when there's a great uh, coordination between the hemispheres of the brain, then every action is spontaneously done, and in that spontaneity, every action is a right action. Hmm? But people misinterpret this. People could see a situation, and they could not understand the situation, and interpret it according to their own minds. It reminds me of a story. There were two nuns who got stuck without gas, petrol we call it in England, uh, in the car, and they needed gas, and the garage was half a mile away. So they had to have a container. Hmm? So the only thing, rummaging through the car, the only thing they could find was a chamber pot. Do you call it that here? Hmm? Chamber pot? Hmm. So they took the chamber pot to the garage and filled it up and brought it to the car and start pouring in the gas. Meanwhile, at that time, two GIs were passing, two soldiers. So they stood and looked at the nuns, what they were doing. So after a while they could contain themselves no longer, and so the one says to the nun, Madam, I don't think this will work, but I sure do admire your faith. <laughs> you see. You see what the GI saw and what was in reality. In the same way, because of our mental patternings, we see things in our own way. If there is an accident and there are four witnesses, and they are brought to court, each and every witness will give a different kind of evidence. And be lost. Because of fragmentation. So once there is a coordination, then fragmentation gradually becomes lessened and an integration occurs. And that integration gives you strength. So in a systematic process, you delve to the deeper and deeper layers of your mind deeper and deeper layers. And as you go to the subtler and subtler layers, the mind assumes far greater strength. Hmm? The conscious mind, or the brain in its entirety, I was saying yesterday at a talk in Seattle, has 12 billion cells. 12 billion cells in this two and a half or three pound brain. And we are only using one millionth part of it. And science has proof this. So as the other cells are awakened, 
the more and more of the universal mind can flow, then there would arise not conceptions or perceptions, but an awareness. Hmm? An awareness so vast, as Blake would say, capture eternity in an hour. I say capture eternity in a moment. For what is important is this moment, not the past and neither the future. Hmm? And because of mental patternings, if you study your thinking, if you observe your thinking, what are you really doing? You're remembering the past mm? Mm? and swirling it around in your mind all the time. Mm? Oh, Auntie Mary said a bad word to me three weeks ago, so here it is still happening in my mind. Mm? Or if not that, then we are projecting a past happening into the future, but never living in the present, for the present is eternity. There were two Buddhist monks, and of course they are not allowed to touch a woman. This is an old Tibetan story, I think it is. So these two Tibetan monks were about to cross the river, and they found a young lady there who was trying to cross the river. And so one of the monks picked her up and took her across the river. So the two monks went on further to their destination. And after, the, after a while, the one monk says to the other, he says, you know, you've done a bad thing. You picked up that woman and carried her across. You're not supposed to touch a woman. Hmm? So the other monk replies that, no, when I dropped her, she was dropped on the other side of the river, but you are still carrying her in your mind. Huh? <laughs> yes, see. The greatest gift divinity has given man is the ability to forget. Hmm? And I do not mean a loss of memory, but I mean living in the moment, in the here and now. And when you live in the here and now, then you will know the essence of being and the center. For the center is here and So now, the mind, I call it a cunning animal, plays all these funny tricks with us because it is patterned, conditioned. So what is the answer? How can we get away from this conditioning? If you have to work out this conditionings of the mind, which is there since the beginning of this cycle, of the universe, which we might call creation, since the time of the Big Bang. Hmm? And then all those experiences through the mineral, plant and animal kingdoms hmm? are still there. Hmm? And to get away from all those experiences, hmm? you have killed, perhaps in past human lives or as an animal, Hmm? Those impressions are still there. Hmm? The impressions for lust and power and what have you, greed, avarice, covetousness, all those things you have been through, they're still there. And now and then, external, objective or subjective circumstances bring it to the fore and your actions and thought processes are dependent upon it. Hmm? For thought is also a thing, hmm? in a subtle form. So, now that is the area of the subconscious mind. Hmm? 
which translates its impressions to the conscious layer of the mind, and that's just as far as modern psychology goes. And yet they haven't touched the fringes of the various layers and sub-layers of the subconscious. But beyond that, there is the super-conscious mind, which is still and at peace, being at the highest level of relativity, and that level man can reach. And a person would think, what about all these impressions? What about all my actions? For we know the law of karma, that whatever you sow, that shall ye reap. That is the law of karma, if you just live ordinarily. If you just pass through life, waste life in mundane matters. But the superconscious level of the mind can be reached through meditation and spiritual practices. It can definitely be reached. There is a hotline from the conscious mind to the superconscious level of the mind. And by activating that hotline, by dialing, you can reach the superconscious level, but you just don't dial. How can it ring on the other side? Huh? Yes, sir. So, one could, through a systematic method, reach the superconscious level of the mind, and from that vast storehouse of energy, bring it forth into the conscious level of the mind and modify the patterns of the subconscious mind at the same time. For what you are drawing is that divine energy, which we could call light. And the darkness in the subconscious mind could never exist in the power of that light. Hmm? So, although there is great truth in the saying that whatever you sow, that shall ye reap, there is truth in that. But that truth is just on the relative, small relative level. Hmm? But yet there's a higher level where you can overcome this hmm? by a systematic personalized practice of meditation. Hmm? So, by reaching the superconscious level that is within oneself, it would be like going to a perfume factory. You spend half an hour in a perfume factory, you are not going to come back empty-handed. Hmm? When you spend half an hour in a perfume factory, you come out smelling like perfume. I see. So life is enriched. Life becomes better. And by better I mean life becomes transformed without even trying to transform it. Hmm? And the methods are very simple. At first, you gain some intellectual understanding, and with the understanding, certain practices, which brings about this integration. And then you go beyond the understanding, you reach the area of peace, which passeth all understanding. For understanding could differ from day to day. <clears throat> this boy of 14 was telling his spell, Oh, my father knows nothing. But when the boy reached 21, he says, Oh, my father does know something. <laughs> Who has learned? The father or the boy? Yes, sir. 
So it brings about a greater maturity within us, a greater stability within us. 99.99% of the world's people are insane. Yes. <laughs> the sane person, the fully integrated person is just that point, nil, nil, one, zero, zero, one. So people lack that total integration, which is called self-realization. Some are on a higher rung of the ladder in evolution, and some are still on a lower rung, but all are proceeding consciously or unconsciously to that which is divine, to that which brings peace and joy. And that's what we all want. Hmm? And that is the center. The center of the universe is not here or there or anywhere in particular. The center is everywhere. The center is where your attention is. Hmm? If your center if your attention is on misery, then that is your center of the universe, of your universe. If your attention is on joy, then that is your center of the universe. That is your center of being. So being does not reside in my fingers or my toes or my heart or it resides if. I am the immortal spirit. Hmm? And from day to day, as I change my clothes, I change my bodies. Hmm? Even here now in this lifetime, hmm? in every 17 days, uh, your entire blood system is changed. Hmm? In other words, 17 days ago, you were somebody else. Hmm? Well, let us say, an infant grows into a boy. Hmm? The boy, adolescence, and then manhood, still the same person, no different person. He's still John or Jack or Jim. Hmm? So, on the spiritual path, we develop from that infancy to maturity. Mm? And when one has found that inner maturity, mm, then one finds stability. Then one finds a meaning to life. Then one finds a purpose to life instead of just drift along and all this comes about because you operate from a firm foundation your boat now has a rudder it is not a rudderless tossed and uh, tossed about on the waves of the ocean and yet when the rudder is there your boat can go in the direction you want it to go, although the waves might be turbulent. Hmm? Those tur the turbulence of the waves are accepted. Hmm? For by diving to the deeper layers of the mind, as you dive just slightly below the waves of the ocean, you find the calmness. Huh? Isn't that what we want? To find that calmness. Hmm? Hmm. Hmm. You must have a joke or two here. Can't make you think too much. Uh, there is this minister was 
talking in his sermon about intemperance. And he says he wished that all the liquor in the world would be poured into the river. And then after this sermon, he says, now let us sing a hymn. Open up to page 94, and the hymn was, let us all gather at the river. <laughs> <laughs> this one guru uh, dropped into a saloon, a bar. He was thirsty, and he wanted a glass of milk. So the bartender made a mistake and put some punch into the milk. So the minister drank it, the guru drank it, and uh, after a few moments he looks up to the heavens and he says, Oh Lord, what a cow! <laughs> <laughs> you see, so what we really require requires no effort at all hmm? to gain new perspectives of life by listening to wisdom of sages, of great men. And also putting into practice the practices that are given, individually prescribed, and life becomes smoother, you become radiant, sparkling, joyful. And then you stop being the living dead, you live for, we believe in one thing, life, love and laughter. Hmm? Yes. For everything around you is laughing. Hmm. Everything around you is laughing. Can you see this flower laughing? Hmm? If you walk outside, the blades of grass are dancing. Hmm. You know, the breeze is blowing its symphony, playing its symphony in the leaves of the trees. Everything is swaying in such beautiful rhythm. Only the hill is unrhythmic. And then they blame everyone else. They blame the wives, hmm? or they blame their friends, they blame the children. Mm. Then, if not that, when the wife says, oh, come, come, shut up, mm. then they blame the guru. And if they can't finish by blaming the guru, then they blame the god. But not themselves, because we do, we do not have the strength to face ourselves in the mirror. And this is what spiritual practices teach you to face yourself in the mirror squarely and say, I, Joan, mm. am I, Joan? Is this exterior? Is this my real self? Mm. Or is there another reality? Mm. And these psychologists talk of altered states of consciousness. Consciousness can never be altered, and it's neither a state, it just is. What they might be talking about is a small little conscious level of the mind, hmm? and they want to alter that. Hmm? And then they start with psychedelic drugs and all kinds of nonsense. Hmm? Everything is there in you, it's inbuilt. Do you know, <clears throat> there was this one man who used to um, visit a cafeteria. And what he used to do is order one of those cans of soft drinks. And uh, the first day he went there, the shopkeeper served him with a can. He sat down at the table and took out a can opener from his pocket and he opened the can and had his soft drink. And every morning he used to drop in there for the soft drink. So a few weeks go by and the shopkeeper, uh, his curiosity could not hold him. 
that why should this man use a can opener when there's a little thing on the can that you pull and the can gets open and you have your soft drink. So the shopkeeper asked him, excuse me, sir, but there is this little thing that opens the can. Why do you use a can opener? So this man replies that that little thing is there for people who do not have a can, can opener. <laughs> so everything is inbuilt. Everything is there within you. Hmm? Everything is there within you. But we just fail to use it. And therefore the need for spiritual masters to come along, remind you of it, and show you how to use the tools that you already have. How to change the perspectives, how to look at life and the world from a different angle by developing some understanding. Hmm? You have teachers and teachers and teachers in the world, but there are some perhaps who could actually impart a spiritual force apart from the teachings that would transform your life and make you find your own center. That's it. And today, most religions have been so watered down. It reminds me of a story with this Mullah Nasruddin. He had a knock on the door. And uh, this man came there and brought this Mullah a lot of vegetables. The mullah thanked him. The mullah thought, what must I do with all these vegetables now? He said, I'll make a pot of soup. So he made a pot of soup and he helped himself as much as he can. A little while later, there's another knock at the door and the man said, I'm a friend of the person who brought you the vegetables. So mullah invited him in. That's an Eastern custom. You always offer something. So he gave him some soup. And then the second knock, third knock came, and the fourth knock came, and the person said, I'm the friend of the friend of the friend who brought you the vegetables. Mm. And so the mullah gave him some soup as well. Meanwhile, the soup was getting less and less, so the mullah was adding a bit and bit of more water mm, to the pot. Right. So the fifth and the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and the ninth knock came, and this fellow says that, uh, Mullah, I'm the friend of 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 the friend who brought you the vegetables. And then Mullah offered him a bowl of soup. So this man says, uh, Mullah, uh, this is not soup, this is just water. So the Mullah replies, he says, seeing that you are the friend of 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 the friend, this is the soup of the soup of the soup of the soup of the soup. <laughs> and that is what has happened to all these age-old ancient teachings, so profound, so deep. Hmm? So a true spiritual master comes to revive the truth, the real soup, and not the watered-down soup. So that you can find your center. That is the purpose of a spiritual master. And as the Gita says, that when evil rises in the world, and a great imbalance occurs, I take birth from age to age to revive eternal truths. I need eyes to see. Mm, understand? That is the trouble, really. Mm? Do we really have eyes to see? Hmm? 
what do we see? Yeah. We only see things that befit us or are advantageous to us. We forget the benefits of others. We are self-centered. Self-centered with the little ego sense we have, but that is not the censoring, centering we want. We want to be centered in reality, in being. That's the beauty of life. And life is joyous, beautiful, beyond measure. Man is not made for suffering. And when we can not annihilate, but expand, clarify the little ego self, then we can really see. For what I teach of is not of any religion. I teach of truth. Religion today has just become trappings, and the truth is lost. So mixed up in its mythologies and ritualisms and what have you. So there's nothing wrong with it. They're good for some people. Yes, everything is good. Everything is perfect. How can there be any imperfection? From the good can only come good. And if the manifester is perfect, then his manifestation is also perfect. Everything is perfect. And all opposites are true. Hmm? Yes. Depends how you look at it. Hmm? So, through spiritual practices, when one develops that awareness, then you have a panoramic view of life, and not just a small section of life. Hmm? When you think, the ego thinks, that you are the center of the universe, and the whole world revolves around me. You are the center of the universe, but not from the level of the ego, but from the level of being. Okay. See? That's an hour now. Hmm? Then we'll have a little break, and uh, then we'll have a rapid-fire question and answer session. Hmm? Good. It seems to... Good, shall we just <clears throat> meditate for a few seconds, few moments to settle down?
Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Open your eyes slowly. Good questions. Yes. I have one you said. I'm not I don't know if I understand you right, but um, I wonder if you think that the Christian religion is a kind of uh, not uh, not uh, it's not enough. But uh, the kind of the way from first to seventh, uh, the Christian religion is this uh, um, to say this. Uh, You said two things, and then the, the one thing, and then, yeah. I know what you mean. I could see the thought playing above your head. Um, all religions, including Christianity, are good religions. They were created at a time when man needed those teachings most. But those teachings at the same time are eternal. And the failure is not of the religion. The failure is of man understanding the religion. Christianity contains the greatest truths. What greater truths can there be than by saying, I and my Father are one? That shows your unity consciousness. But man has taken, as in every religion, man has taken words literally and not its deeper meaning because the understanding is not there. The understanding is not there is because the awareness is not there. So I've said this many, many times over and over again that I would like to see a Christian become a better Christian a Hindu, a better Hindu, a Buddhist, a better Buddhist. In other words, man must be transformed. So whatever religion he believes in, I support. I want man to become a better man. I teach of humanity. Let man become a really human. Let him really live in the image of God. Yeah, I just want to say that um, said uh, uh, Jesus did suffer. Uh, yes. The purpose of man is not to suffer, it is to bring joy. As I understand, in Christian, it's both. Because mm-hmm. Jesus always said, be of good cheer. If he was not of good cheer, he would have never preached that. But he's suffering. The things he suffered, the way I do suffer, is not my own suffering. When I look around and see the sadness and the unhappinesses on people's faces, I pierce their hearts and see their feelings, and that makes me suffer. That Lord, you have given me so much joy, I bubble over in joyousness, every moment of the day, and here my brothers and sisters who are really myself, why must they suffer? Why can't they develop a greater understanding so that suffering becomes an offering? See, so that was the suffering of Jesus. Hmm? Meanwhile, he was a jolly good old chap. Cheerful he was. Hmm? What do you think about uh, taking some understandings from different uh, religions and put together make your own thoughts? Yes, you could do that. You could definitely do that. But as you go on doing that, you can start from there. 
But as you go on doing that, you will find that the basis of all religions is the same. And the outer methods might differ according to different cultures, different backgrounds, but that is not important. The basis of truth is the same. In Bloom, you'll find, you must have seen on the, the brochure, you'll find all the religions are on there, all the major religions are on there. Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Confucianism, Islam, all the religions are there. And then there's one symbol which is the eternal spiral that represents the religions that are not reflected on the emblem because you can't get all in. Because a person might have his own personal religion. There is no atheist in the world. There is a theist. Yes. So, therefore, you can formulate your own ideas. And as you go on formulating your own ideas, you will come to the basis that all is one and what we are after is the truth which we have. Light upon the path so that you do not stumble and fall. But you have to walk the path yourself. And I encourage you to that. It is so beautiful, yet one must have that desire to find that peace. People don't really have a burning desire, they only indulge in wishful thinking, and that gets you nowhere. Got to have determination, perseverance, to find that peace. And once a person becomes integrated, then all the emotional problems disappear. There's a balance. Balance is created. But then, of course, I feel sorry for the psychologists and psychiatrists. They wouldn't make a living. <laughs> you see? So that is the goal and aim of life. Whatever path you follow, it's not important. Let's see if I can't find another joke for you. Ah, oh, there was this man, he was a great football fan, and uh, he goes to his minister and says, um, Look, sir, you speak to God every day. Would you ask him if there's football in heaven? Hmm? So the minister says, Look, come back in, in a week's time, and I'll see what there is. Hmm? Uh, so this man went back in a week's time and he says, Sir, your reverend, um, have you spoken to God and found the answer for me? So the reverend says, Yes, that there is football in heaven and they've reserved a front row seat for you in next week's big match. <laughs> Good next question. Anyone else? Hmm? Oh, just find another one while you're thinking. Hmm. See, this one man was very, was very close to, to God and he ascended right up to heaven to be with God. And so the time came for lunch, and um, God served a small bowl of soup to him and for himself. So then from that high point, they could see everything happening on the other levels. And this man saw uh, at other levels, they were enjoying great feasts, uh, the roasts, and I don't know what all they have in feasts, and all the goodies were there. So this man complained, and there were tons of people on other levels enjoying these vast feasts. And so this man complains to God. 
He says, look at those people at such a lower level having all these great feasts. And here, you and I, just a bowl of soup. Mm, very thin soup also, no substance in it. So God says, look, it's just you and I, so why bother cooking a big meal? <laughs> uh, next question. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have an hour question on the... Sorry. Yeah. Can you forget? Let's see. Lack of concentration. Now, through spiritual practices, your concentration increases, where without concentrating, all the energies of your mind become focused. So you must learn to meditate. When you speak on Dalian, you speak on Dalian, um, the mental state, the consciousness, or...? No, there is so above, so below. There's no heaven out there and there's no hell out there. Hmm? It is all within you, your states of consciousness. For example, if you suffer misery, it is through your mind and that is hell. And if you have suffered joy, that is heaven. Hmm? Like one man was telling, his friend, he says, I am definitely going to heaven when I die. So this friend asks, how can you be so sure you're going to heaven? Hmm? So he says, well, I'm having hell here. <laughs> yes, it's a state of consciousness. Yeah, and as the ego becomes more clarified, and as one allows that energy in its full force to shine through, then life becomes a heaven. Hmm? And this idea of heaven and hell on the other side it was perpetrated upon man uh, for certain reasons at certain times. And for example, the Islamic religion tells you that uh, you must not drink wine and uh, all these various things, they forbid you, thou shalt not, this, this, this. But they say if you live a good life, then on the other side, there'll be rivers of wine flowing and there'll be hauris, pretty damsels to look after you and all this and that. Hmm? After you die. So this man asks me, what is the truth in it? So I told him, do you really believe that? Hmm? Do you have total faith in that? Then you will find that after you're dead. Because the heavens and hells are created by your own mind. The entire universe is a projection of your own mind. And funny enough, uh, they always promise you the good is after you're dead. There are two organizations that do that, the insurance companies and the churches. The insurance companies promise you a large sum of money after you're dead, and the churches promise you all the pleasures of heaven after you're dead. I want you to enjoy the heaven here and now while you are alive. A subject of karma. It is. It, it is a very long subject. Um, I wouldn't be able to cover it in just a short answer. But karma is a, a relative thing. Uh, relative in the sense that uh, whatever you do here, you would have to pay for it. 
that is for sure. Whatever you sow, you shall reap, as I said earlier. But that can be avoided. Karma can be overcome. It is not a hard and fast law. I was saying yesterday, as a matter of fact, that say for five seconds you have a negative thought, then make some effort for the next six seconds to have a positive thought, one in the credit balance, for the next 10 seconds a negative thought, then 12 seconds a good thought, then you have three in the credit balance, and like that if your day goes on and you go to sleep at night, you'll sleep so well hmm, that you have so much in the credit balance, and you times that by 365 days, and then again you times that by three score and ten years or whatever you might live. And then you can truly say to yourself that I'm leaving this world better than I came. For we are just passing by here. This little life there is nothing in the concept of eternity. It is nothing. There was this... Um, Canadian student of a great rabbi in Israel. So uh, this rabbi wrote a lot of books, and this Canadian man um, read them all. Uh, he was his favorite author, the rabbi. So one day when he, when he went to Israel and he was passing the village where the rabbi lived, and he went in there and introduced himself, so the rabbi welcomed him. And um, he said, I'm very sorry, sir, but it's a Middle East and an Eastern custom where if you go to a holy man, you always go with a gift, even if it's just a flower or a petal of a flower. It's an offering. It's a mark of respect. Yes, he says, seeing that I was just passing by, I brought no offering for you, sir, he tells the rabbi. So after the talking, 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 the Canadian looked around and he saw the room totally bare. They were sitting on the floor. Uh, so he asked the rabbi, So why is your room so totally bare? So the rabbi replies, I'm also just passing by. Huh? We are all passing by. And the best we can do hmm, is to better ourselves. For any scripture does not say you must know God. It says, man, know thyself. By knowing thyself, you will know the center of yourself, and the center of yourself is divinity itself. Let's see. Next. Hmm. Sometimes the sense of your ego, uh, you have to and the eternal, the eternal, the one of the eternal, one of the things that's common. Do you have to be very able to completely forget yourself? No. Remember yourself. Do not forget yourself. Mm. Why must you forget yourself? If you forget yourself totally, you wouldn't be able to exist in this world. But what I would say, that at the same time of remembering yourself, remember yourself to be divine, and that you are one with divinity. And that comes through self-integration. It is not self-forgetfulness or annihilation of the ego. It is clarifying the ego through spiritual practices, so that you do not forget yourself, and neither would you forget divinity. You live life on both levels at the same time. I talk of myself. Every word I would say to you is of personal experience, but I live on both levels. I live as an ordinary man, Mm, laughing, joking, having fun. Mm, at the same time, I feel within myself the divine force all the time. Just there. Uh, hmm? Where is the lack of uh, self-confidence and the, you came into the situations with Miranda? We are in doubts. You come into those situations. 
Mm-hmm. 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 Before you carry on, what system are you meditating? On our systems? No. I would look out the window mm-hmm. and I would breathe deeply to get to be healed. Mm-hmm. You know, I would do that. And I would look just outside the window at mm-hmm. the world, at the universe. Mm-hmm. And this particular afternoon, I felt at another point mm-hmm. that the trees, the flowers, the sky, everything that I beheld with my eyes was part of me. And beautiful, beautiful. And mm-hmm. How you could increase such harmony mm-hmm. within you. Well, that's right. Now, what you had was just a glimpse. It's like an overcast sky, and there's a chink in the clouds, and the sun just shines through, and then the clouds close up again. Now, if you are put on a personalized system of meditation as we do, see, there are no two people alike in the world, um, and you can't have one generalized method for everyone. So in our systems, we have personalized techniques for the individual. There are no two people alike. Uh, You can't just have one bottle of medicine that would cure all diseases. So in our system, what I do, um, you get a form that you fill in with some simple questions, and you attach a photograph to it. And then from throughout the world, we, we have our uh, organizations. Well, Canadian Meditation Society has just started, but in other countries established for many years. Uh, and a photograph is attached to the form. And as soon
would teach it over to you because they are taught how to teach. In other words, I'm the physician and the teachers here are the dispensers, the pharmacists. They dispense and they teach you how to do the practice here. that uh, you reach the goal quicker, being personalized. And so you'd be working with your own vibrations. And what is more harmonious than your own vibrations? And you work with that. And you'd find you systematically going to the deeper and deeper and deeper layers of the mind and beyond the mind, where you become the observer of life. You become non-attached to life, which means not being running away from life, but like the Bible would say, to be in the world and yet not of the world. Life becomes joyous, beautiful. Mm, ten to ten. And you know, you talk of meditation. This one man who went to uh, a real estate agent, and he says, "I want to buy a house, but the house must be at least a mile away from other houses. Mm? At least a mile away." So. Uh, can you find a house like that for me where it's totally quiet? So this uh, real estate agent uh, was a meditator, so he asked, do you want a lonely place to meditate? So this man replies, no, I want to practice my saxophone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Mr. Walters has just been pointing out the time to me, they close at 10 and the equipment has to be packed there. So. Thank you very, very much. It's been so nice meeting you. Mm -hmm. Quickie. Let's have a quickie. Okay, you were talking about centering. Being here and now is love and joy and happiness. I believe that totally. And you should forget the past and don't think of the future. Okay, in the past, mm -hmm. I mean, what if someone comes up to you and tries to remind you when you don't want to? I mean, you're happy now, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, then, then all the happenings of the past, someone comes along and reminds you, you view it objectively. You view it as an experience which, is, which was necessary for you at that time to bring you to the level that you are experiencing the here and now, now. No, do you talk about it still? You just bring it up and talk about it all the time? Yes, let them talk about it. Okay. It's okay. okay let, no, let, 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 let the world remind you of it. It only becomes damaging if you start mulling over it. But if you observe it as if you're sitting in a cinema and watching the screen, and all the happenings there on the screen, you, you can't change it. If the man does this, that, or whatever, goes and robs a bank, you can't change the situation on the screen. But you know at the same time that you are not involved with what's happening in the screen. You're sitting there as an observer, so you become a, an observer. And even the thoughts in the mind, you look at them objectively as an observer, so that you do not feel the sufferings. Man is there. Yes.